What up, Switch fam? If I have not had the honor and privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Zach, and I get to be one of the Switch pastors here. Fun fact about me, my parents did give me a Chinese name when I was born, and that name is Jia Lin. And yes, it does have a meaning. Are you ready for it? My Chinese name means unicorn. That's right. I am a unicorn. Now you'd think that my parents would give me a name like Dragon Slayer or something like that, but no, they named me unicorn. But you know what? I'm going to own my Chinese name so my Chinese name doesn't own me. So go ahead, write in the chat, Pastor Unicorn, Unicorn Zach, whatever you want. I own it. I am a unicorn. But enough about me. Uh, I want to share with you a little bit about my family. So up behind me, you will see a photo of my family. That is my beautiful wife, Mackenzie. We have been married for eight years. She is so fantastic. She has been a huge support in my life. She was also a basketball player in college, so she's definitely a hooper. And last year, she gave birth to our wonderful daughter, Samantha, who is so precious to me. And yes, she too has a Chinese name. It is Jing Mei, and that name means little unicorn. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what her name means. It means beautiful. And that's exactly what she is. And watching Samantha grow up is one of the most rewarding and amazing things I've ever seen in my life. When she was first born, we watched her as she just learned how to raise her head. And then she started rolling back and forth on her stomach. And then she went into the stage of crawling and then walking. And now she's even climbing on things and even beginning to talk. And it is just so amazing to see. And every single stage that she entered, we cheered, we celebrated. Why? because it was showing growth, it was showing maturity. And while identifying maturity in life is relatively easy, sometimes identifying maturity in our faith or growth in our faith is not so easy, isn't it? Like what exactly is spiritual growth? Is it having the entire Bible memorized? Is it praying for 50 hours a day, even though that's physically impossible? Is it living a sinlessly perfect life? Well, from the beginning of this year, we have been talking about what it looks like to become a fully devoted follower of Christ. And we have been talking about looking like Jesus for the sake of others. And truth be told, the Bible gives us a lot of different measures as to what spiritual maturity looks like. Some of it is the fruit of the spirit. Some of it is holiness. Some of it is depth of understanding of the word of God. But what we're gonna do today is we're going to look at something that Jesus identifies as spiritual maturity at the end of Matthew chapter 28, and that is making disciples. And if you're here with us today and you're taking notes this is the big idea. This is our big thought for today. And that is becoming a fully devoted follower of Christ means becoming a disciple making disciple. I'll say that again. Becoming a fully devoted follower of Christ means becoming a disciple making disciple. And the anchor text that we're gonna be going to today is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And these are the last recorded words of Jesus by the author Matthew. So this is clearly the most important part of his book. And this is what Jesus says. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And what we're gonna do here right now is we're gonna break this passage down into three parts. First, we're gonna talk about how disciple making disciples bring people to Jesus. Second, we're gonna talk about how they show people how to follow him. And lastly, we're gonna talk about how they remember 
that Jesus is with them always. So let's start with the first part. Disciple making disciples bring people to Jesus. In verse 19, it reads, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, the force of those two words there, go and make, is a command. And I know that in English today, we tend to gloss over certain words. We don't really think in terms of imperatives or commands, but in the original language, that's exactly the force behind what Jesus is saying. So this is a command, go and make disciples. Then immediately after that, Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does baptism have to do with making disciples? Well, first of all, baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision. It is a public declaration that you are a follower of Christ. And for those of us who are already followers of Jesus, we have a call on our lives to lead people to Christ and trust and hope and pray that he will do the changing in their lives. So again, baptism is a sign and a symbol that a person has a new life in Christ. And our call is to do what only we can do, which is bring people to Jesus and trust and pray that he will do what only he can do, which is change them. That is the first step to being a disciple making disciple. Now, am I suggesting that we should all have inflatable pools in our backpack so that way when we bring someone to Jesus, we can immediately dunk them into water. No, I'm not suggesting that. And I don't think Jesus is suggesting that either. But what Jesus is getting at is that we are to live lives on mission. He wants us to have a heart that will do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. And to reach people that no one is reaching, we'll have to do things that no one is doing. And for some of you here, the place where you start is by grabbing one of those invite cards on your seats and inviting a student at your school back with you to switch IRL. For others of you, maybe it's sharing the link to switch online with one of your friends and you guys watch it together and you type it in the chat. Or others of you, maybe you attend a different church and you have the opportunity to invite someone to attend church with you. The point is this, we have to be intentional. We have to build intentional relationships with other people, hoping and praying that one day they will place their trust in Jesus and maybe one day get baptized. So disciple making disciples bring people to Jesus. That's the first part. The second part is that disciple making disciples show people how to follow him. In verse 20, it reads, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The fact that Jesus tells his followers to obey means that there's a dual aspect going on here. There should be a teaching, but also an obeying or living out what Jesus says. To obey in the Bible is to align one's heart, mind, and soul with the will of God. It's to love God with all that we are and to love others. That's why I think that uh, Matthew 22 verses 37 through 40 are so powerful because there Jesus lays out for us the great commandments. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, Jesus, he's not concerned about knowledge transfer. He is concerned about heart transformation. And this type of teaching, this type of leadership, this doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to sit down with someone, to help them know the scripture, to help them understand scripture, and to help them align their hearts, minds, and souls with the will of God. That's why the full command is to make disciples, not simply teach the Bible. But do you also see what Jesus is doing here? He's saying that we have to obey 
his commands. And it is so hard for us to obey if we don't know. So firstly, we have to know what Jesus says. But more importantly, we have to do what Jesus says because it is so much easier and it is so much more powerful when leading another person, if we can model for them, if we can show people how to follow Jesus. Two switch leaders that I know, their names are Tom and Mario. They lead a small group of high school guys who are all on the same wrestling team together. And these guys, They come from rough backgrounds. For some of them, their parents aren't in the picture. They're being raised by someone else. For others of them, they're living in a place that they don't even call home. But Tom and Mario started investing in these guys about a year and a half ago. And what I love about these two leaders is that they model what it looks like to follow Jesus. They practice what they preach. They don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. For instance, Tom reads out of an NIV application study Bible. Do you know what an NIV application study Bible is? This is that Bible, look at this thing. This is what it is. And he got one of these for all of the guys in his group. And I have seen them walking around our campus. I've seen them walking out in public, carrying these Bibles. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. But Tom and Mario, they didn't stop there. They continued to show up in their lives. They attended their high school football games. They went to their wrestling matches. And now in their group, they're going beyond just casual conversation. And they're talking about temptations, trials, struggles in life, and they're holding one another accountable. And they're walking through all of the problems that life throws their way. And I have seen such growth and maturity in this group. I've seen guys get baptized. I've seen them overcome hardships. This is why it's so important to model for other people and show them what it looks like to follow Jesus. The third part of this passage is in verse 20. And Jesus tells us these words. He says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Disciple making disciples, remember that Jesus is with them. When Jesus leaves these instructions, it is an incredible and encouraging and comforting promise. He says, I will be with you. And if you're here and you're listening to us talk about this, and you might be thinking to yourself, Zach, this sounds really, really hard. I don't know if I can do this. Well, I have good news for you. Are you ready? Jesus is with you. And if Jesus is with you, that means his presence is with you and his power is with you. So no matter what, he will give you the strength when you're feeling weak. He'll give you courage when you're afraid and he'll give you peace when you're overwhelmed. Never forget that. And as we take on this monumental task of preaching the gospel, of baptizing believers, of teaching them to obey God's commands, of experiencing rejection, and even in some cases, persecution, just know Jesus is with you every step of the way. So if you're afraid that you don't know what you'll say, remember, Jesus is with you, giving you the words to speak. If you doubt that you have the ability to make disciples, Jesus is with you and he is empowering you to do the will of God. If you're concerned that you'll be hated and rejected, Jesus is with you, protecting you and even welcoming you home. And if you fear the unknown, just know Jesus is with you, guiding your every step. So what does it look like to experience spiritual maturity or growth in our faith, it looks like being a disciple who makes disciples. I've seen this 
most powerfully in my life when a man named Gus discipled me. Growing up, I really struggled with self-worth. I really struggled with feeling like I had significance in life because I was basing my life off of this lie that my performance plus other people's opinions equaled my self-worth. That's where I had value. And so when my life was going well and I felt like people liked me, I was on top of the world. But when my life was going poorly and I felt like people disliked me, I thought there was nothing worse on this planet. And I struggled with thoughts of doubt, anxiety, thoughts of depression even. And it wasn't until my sophomore year of college that Gus came into my life and he started to disciple me. And every single week we would sit down on this bench and he would talk to me about the word of God. We would talk through my trials, my temptations, my hardships, and he would model for me what it looked like to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. And when I discovered the truth of God's word, that I was deeply, unconditionally loved by God, that I was completely forgiven of all of my sin, that I was totally accepted and fully pleasing to God and it had nothing to do with my performance and it had nothing to do with other people's opinions of me. It had everything to do with placing my hope, faith and trust in Jesus Christ. My life was radically changed. And I said, Jesus, if you're this good, I will follow you anywhere. And later that summer, I got baptized and Gus was there. And even to this day, he and I maintain a relationship and a friendship and he and his family are now impacting me and my family. And I can say with absolute truth that I am where I am today and I am who I am today because I had a discipler like Gus in my life. That is the power of being a disciple making disciple. So what do we know? We know that disciple making disciples bring people to Jesus. We know that they show people how to follow Jesus. And we, we know that they remember that he is always with them. So let's go and let's make disciples today. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for every single person viewing this right now, for every single person who's hearing your message. God, I pray that we can be people who make disciples. I pray that we can be people who teach others to obey your commands and remember that you are always with us. And now while we're still here in an attitude of prayer, I wanna talk to those of you here who you might be listening to us talk about making disciples, being baptized, obeying Christ's commands, and you realize you are not a follower of Jesus. You have never placed your trust in him. And you think, man, Jesus doesn't want me. He doesn't want a relationship with me. I've messed up. I've made too many mistakes. Well, here's the bad news. The bad news is we all have sin in our lives. You have it and I have it. And sin is anything that separates us from the heart of God. It's the times we make mistakes, it's the times we break his commands. It's the times that we hurt other people. And God says that there is an eternal separation between us and God. But here's the good news. The good news is that God loves you so much that he made a way for you to be brought back into a relationship with him. And that is through his son, Jesus Christ, who 2000 years ago died on a cross for our sins and three days later he rose again so that way anyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life and if you're here today and you want to experience forgiveness of sins and you want to experience new life in Christ then go ahead and type in the chat right now just type in the chat I want new life in Christ Well, guys, even though choosing to follow Jesus is a decision that we make on our own, 
in moments like these, we always pray together as a family. So will you guys repeat these words after me? Say, Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I trust you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins and to give me new life. Help me to love others just as you love me. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, I am so proud of you. But more importantly, God is proud of you and he loves you and he will never, ever leave you.